Welcome everyone to episode 86 of Just Joshing. I am your host, Joshua Pentelaresco. I write stuff and podcast too. And we are now back on our regularly scheduled numbering. And my guest this week is AP Fuchs. AP Fuchs has been on the show before. He is a writer, a comic book inker, an all around talent. He is definitely one of the coolest dudes I met in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and he currently has a Kickstarter going on right now that deals with Aurora Man, and uh, you should definitely check it out while you can. Um, this is this was his request. This we, me and him had, um, like I said, we hung out a little bit at the retreat. I met him at C4 very briefly two years ago now. Um, very cool dude, and I, I definitely recommend picking something up from his impressive library of books. Now, I got before we get to that, though, I got to actually talk to each and every one of you. Last week, I got I set a new high for the podcast, and I want to thank everybody who listened and subscribed to it. Um, my podcast is also now expanding onto YouTube. I have uh, uploaded currently, I think, 29 episodes. There will be 31 by the time Wednesday morning hits. Um, right now, I'm just putting up all the two-parters, all the people that have been on the podcast multiple times first, and then I'll be gradually catching up in numeric order from there with everybody that's left. Um, but it's been really fun. And just looking back, I've talked to some really, really, really cool people. And I'm bringing this up now because literally I am seven weeks away from episode 100 and – Ironically enough, episode 100, when it comes out, will also be when I will be doing my first ever live podcast, which is actually, I think, a really cool thing I just realized right now. I got to do something. Maybe the 100th episode will be the live podcast. I don't know. I do know this. Um, yeah, like this podcast has grown, and it's, it's slowly evolving, and I want to thank everybody for doing that. Um, I'm still doing the writing stuff. I've, I've already handed in two things. A, also a completed book and I'm and I'm working on really diligently on this draft of Cloud Diver. I'm really behind on it and I felt really bad about it and I realized that each part is approximately seven to eight thousand words. So, you know, each part I'm finishing is is definitely a big piece like in and of itself. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun to do. Um, I'm I'm free and clear and I could keep talking forever. A lot of things are happening, as you can see. So I'm going to just get right to it and talk to AP. But first, a message from, well, yours truly, because why not? Looking for my archive episodes of Just Joshing? You can do so on my YouTube channel, Joshua Pentelaresco. J-O-S-H-U-A-P-A-N-T-A-L-L. E R E S C O. There you will find past episodes with guests like Susie Vidori, Ron Bender, Ella Beaumont, Colette Turner, Chadwick Ginther, and more. Be able to check out my YouTube channel any right now. So anything, anything you want to say? It's too late now. It's on. It's up. It's ready to go. All right. Yeah. So. So I I've been looking at your history, man. Dude, you've done a lot. Like you really have done a lot of stuff. It's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So. All I can say is thanks. It's yeah, quite the road. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I, so, I'm gonna start like this. Okay. I don't know. You, have you listened to a few of my podcasts? I listened to a couple of them. Yeah, yeah. So you know they go everywhere, right? Yeah, and that's totally fine. Yeah, it's gonna go anywhere and everywhere, depending on how what you how you answer, where we go, and. It is the it, it's a conversation. It's kind of the whole idea behind this, anyway. So, the thing I'm the thing is, um, you you're like, like what was it? Was it art? Was it writing? Was it um, was it was it both? Was it like what what got you in? It was the art thing, comics, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this on the last podcast. So that's, that's why that's why we're, we're starting. We're starting new. We're, we're starting. Well, the thing is. My podcast has been growing in hits, more and more hits. So, as popular as you were the first time, you're probably going to be more popular this time around. Case you right. just here now. So, assume it's someone's first time. So, do, am I calling you AP or am I calling you Adam for this? For this? 
I don't know, the branding is AP Fuchs, right? So, but so okay. It's fun, you know. So this is the legendary, the one, the only, the inspirational rock star of the Winnipeg independent scene, Abe. He's got a grin on his face, folks. I almost may be able to make him blush. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you no, just... It started with the art thing. I was going to do comics, right? Mm -hmm. And that was awesome. And I love making and drawing comics and stuff. And then I got into... Uh, I took a year off after high school just to kind of do my own thing. And then I went to an animation school for the year after. And that was a horrific experience. I won't get into details. But bottom line is it pushed me away from the art world. It kind of did the opposite of what it was supposed to do. But then I got into writing out of it, uh, starting to write comic scripts, into writing short stories, which eventually led to my first novel. And then it, for a while, I was really bitter against the whole art community. Um, I still love comics, don't get me wrong, but I, just in terms of like that that world, that pathway. So I kind of followed the book path. But in the back of my mind, I always had this urge, you know, for comics, right? So fast forward years later, and now I'm kind of in a place where I'm transitioning. So I can do like a writer-artist hybrid kind of deal where I do some books and I do some comics, you know, and that's that's kind of where I'm at. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm, kind, I'm actually kind of jealous a little bit. Because I can't draw, like, my stick figures were both, dude. Like, my stick figures look at me and go, why did you put me on this page? And I'm like, I don't know. It seemed like a good idea. And then they just threatened to beat me. You, if you, you I mean, so I have to, I have to literally scour, like, like just from my end, because I, I think I write pretty good comics. I think. I'm wrong, but I, I think. And, um, and, uh, so, but finding reliable people, right, to Oh, it makes it possible. Yeah, no, it's, it's ridiculously hard. It's like, hey, can you do this? Yeah, I'm in. Then they get to about page three. This is hard. Yes. Yes, it is. It's the most thankless job ever. I mean, you're drawing, if you want to do averages, you're spending eight hours a page. Mm -hmm. Labor. Yeah. And that's just you drawing it. Never mind the guy who colors it. Never mind the guy who letters it. So let's just say a page averages, I don't know, let's just say 14, 15 hours worth of work. Yep. Go a minute. Not even a minute. Well, 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 a writer, a writer, like, like the most detail, the most time I've ever spent on a page is about now, right? And, I, and that's just that's because it was a very intricate scene. Yeah. Most of the time, most of, like, it takes me because you're looking, you look at a script is about between five and ten thousand words, give or take. So you're looking at maybe one or two days of my time. But when you look at a comic book, when you look at a comic book, that is twenty four pages. So it takes a writer two days, two working days at most, on a script. Now, about a month, roughly. Yeah, or, yeah. And then the, the artist is doing a month, right? The artist, the, the, the penciler is doing a month. The anchor, probably, probably in terms of time, maybe half that, but that's still not an easy amount of work. The, color, the colorist, you might actually have make an argument today with the nature of how comics are colored. That might be the second most important job in the entire book. Well, it elevates, elevates the art. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, it, it, I mean, you can... Comics rely on the colorists, because if you actually stop and look at the lines, you can see the lines actually are not that great, and the coloring is what brought it out. Yeah, depending on, depending on the artists. Like, some artists are really good, um, but, but yeah, but so you're looking at that. Now, lettering is probably the easiest of the visual stuff to do, but even then, you're looking at two, three days, maybe a week. Right, a week of their time. Letter the lettering depending on how good the letterer is, if there's any specific uh, fonts or indentations you're kinda of looking for. Right. Well, responsible for story flow, right? Yeah. Where the boots are on the panel. Yeah, exactly. The guys are the guy drew the panel to without keeping the letterer in mind, and then that causes a big problem for the Absolutely. Letterer, where are you gonna put the words, right? Well, I, I, I keep that in mind too when I do my I do my scripts, right? Because it's like you try to be as dialogue um, efficient as possible, and that's actually I think the biggest challenge as a, from a script point of view, because you realize that a bubble realistically can only hold about forty to fifty words, max, right? You try to keep yeah, right. So you're trying to keep it simple, and you don't want to be so worried. Because one of my least favorite things about Marvel for a long time is a lot of their stuff 
was too bubbly. Like they, they like they had some amazing art in the background, but there was so much dialogue. It's like yeah, yeah. that I like the comics that you actually had to read. Well, no, I know, I know, but there's a way of doing that without killing it, like making it like so. One giant speech bubble. Yeah, no, there are there are ways of doing that, and and, and also like this is one of those things where where sometimes less is more. If the artist can convey the message better than the writer can, right? I think the artist should. It's a visual medium, right? That's just again, this is just my own personal philosophy on this. I'm also of the philosophy that the artist's name should be up first and the writer. Uh, that's that's me, right? Um, I, I I I recognize I recognize the I recognize the um, what's the term the power that the art good art makes or breaks a book more so than good writing. Good writing really can 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 save can save like good writing can make a good comic great, but good art can make a bad comic decent. <laughs> Yeah, see, I'm on the opposite end of that. Yeah. I'm on the end where if the art is kind of eh, or even really crude, but if it's a really interesting story and or really interesting dialogue, then you read it for that, even though the art is lagging. Well, it there's there's value to it. I I just I just think it's easier for the art to save the script. That's just me. I think I think I'm not again. I'm not trying to downgrade what the writer does. There, a lot, more often than not. There's a certain vision, and that vision in itself is without the vision, there's nothing, right? So there's definitely, like, there's definitely a, a thing. I just think, I think at the comics, the thing I love about it is it's truly a collaborative process of mediums between visual, the visual, the written word, and and just and, and the audience's participation because that's because the, the audience is always, I think, a character in a comic because ultimately that's who's interacting with it. Some really good comics, like like um, Ultimate Spider-Man, was aware of the fact that it was a comic book, just based on how just based on how the characters interacted with the reader. You could you could tell it is it's a subtle thing that I, uh, subtle breaking of the fourth wall. Yeah, but it was yeah it wasn't over like you know Deadpool stuff. It was very subtle. It's the way the dialogue was presented. Yeah, not only the di- yeah, the dialogue and the visuals, how the characters interacted, interacted. You could tell, uh, uh, and that's and that's I think like it's one of those things. I think again, I think about this stuff when I write when I write a comic. Do I want the characters to know they're in a comic book? Do I want do I want the reader to have a back and forth with the character? Because again, there's pros and cons to that, right? You gotta be very careful. With, like for example, with um, with if you have that, the sense of danger sometimes isn't there, especially in a superhero yeah. book. You gotta be really careful with that because if you, if it's too inner, like the one the one, the one thing about a Deadpool book, I, they're funny, but I'm never I don't believe for one second he's in any danger ever. No, yeah, yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's, it's not meant to be taken seriously. No, exactly. But again, that, that's the, that's that's the caveat of, of that particular script. No, but compare that to like a Batman book. Yeah, he's in like Dire Straits quite often, or an Nightwing book, or something. Yeah then those take themselves seriously because yeah you as the reader want to believe that he's feeling yeah. it that's what I really appreciated about the uh, the Chuck and his Robin and Nightwing comics like those guys got into serious serious trouble and you wondered like oh yeah Chuck Dixon you, Chuck Dixon is my second favorite writer from that era my yeah. favorite is John Strander like John Strander by is mine I just thought he was writing about stuff that was literally ahead of its time like by about 10, 20 years. So, like, uh, I was a big fan of Hawkworld. I love that book. I don't know if you ever read that one or not. That one, no. Uh, obviously, Suicide Squad is the other big one he's most known for. Matt, I, I think, like, you look at where they are today. It's like the rest of the. It's like the rest of the comic world caught up to it. But Chuck, I've seen some of Chuck's scripts. His he was really, really artist friendly. Right? Like, I, like, he's like, what do you want to do? Let's do it. Yeah, but his scripts are pretty, pretty basic. He's, uh, same with like Mark Wade. Mm-hmm. Very like his panel descriptions were like one or two lines, and that was it. Mm-hmm. You know, and then like the dialogue carried the rest. And then yeah, he let the artist uh, do their thing, so to speak. Yeah. Well, yeah. So in your in your particular case, how do you like doing? Do you like like over detail like Alan Moore, where it's a bible of how to do it, or or do you like? Uh... I used to write scripts very very detailed. 
you know, um, I used to do that, and then I found that really tiring. <laughs> yes. So if I'm writing for somebody else, I kind of do a halfway point between oversimplified and overcome in the middle. If I'm doing it for myself, I actually uh, stop writing scripts, and I do it um, the hard to beat car method, where you just do it with crude stick figures. Yeah. You know? Um, and, and then throw in your bubbles and whatever, like extra half ass cheap, doesn't matter, it's for you, so who cares? And then take those crappy pages and turn them into real pages on the drawing board. Keith Giffen does that stuff sometimes. Yeah, it, it helps. Yeah. I mean, it helps you pre vis a scene or who goes where or like how to describe the shot. I mean, like that could be interpreted so many ways, you know? Yeah. So. So at this point, what are, you, what are you looking to do with your comic stuff since you're going back into it? Like you're ready to become the the artistic paradigm now. That now you rejected it. Now you're just embracing it. I am William the, the paradigm now. Well, I got one graphic novel written um, that's in the thumbnailing stage right now. And that's about only a third of the way through. So I'm just kind of picking at it like thumbnail wise because it's not high priority. Uh, and then I have a horror comic that's been written. Uh, again, Harvey Picar style, which is completed, and I already started doing some of the pages for it. I think it's only around uh, ballparking. I think it's around only around 50 pages or so. So it's going to be released as like a prestige format yeah. style, you know, uh, comic. Um, and it's a series of short uh, horror stories. Okay. Yeah. Instead of just one like long narrative, it's it's like a bunch of shorter horror stories. EC so Comics kind of thing, like an EC. No. Yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah. The little, uh, you know five, six page stories roughly. You know, and I made it some I threw in some like fake funny ads and things like that. So it's meant to be a bit playful as well. Awesome. But the graphic novel is yeah meant to be more of my uh a sim it's very gritty, it takes place on the streets of a homeless guy, uh, looking into the death of his wife, um, because some fishy went down. So it's a bit of a who done it and there's some twists and turns along the way so you know, you think it's so-and-so, but it's really so-and-so, but then, no, it's not that person, it's this person, and so on, you know? And it's meant to see what that kind of does to to a person. So, um, in that case, I should ask this. Like, when you do a mystery kind of thing, I, I, I bullshitted about how to do a mystery um, yeah. with uh, Taya Van Diepen. I bullshitted about that when I was the guest on the podcast, and it was like, do you, 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 um, um, when you do a mystery, like, do you, like, do you, like, have you figured out all the, like, like, the, the twist and turns, like, do you plot it out a little harder, or well, do you... I did, yeah, like, when I did the graphic novel, I did it in three stages, or, sorry, I'm in the fourth stage, that's what would be five stages, um, I just did a general synopsis, like, this is what it's about, and then I did a, a scene by scene out, oh my, um, not terribly detailed, but more so, you know, he goes here, then he there, he finds out this, he finds out that, and kind of outlined it that way, and that enabled me to, because um, I knew who the culprit was in this whole thing, but then by doing that outline, that enabled me to throw in a bunch of red herrings, right, to make the reader think it was somebody else, but really it wasn't, and then later, so that when the reveal happens, you find, you look back now over the story, you know, all the breadcrumbs are there, but they were so far in the background you wouldn't have noticed unless you're paying attention. And then I did I did the actual script. For this one, actually, I, I did the actual script. Again, very basic descriptions because I'm writing it for myself. Now I'm in the thumbnailing stage um, just so I know what the panels would look like. And there's extra crude stick figures, you know, guys with, you know, circle for a head, the little X marks for the, the or cross marks for the faces, you know, stuff like that. And then those will get taken to the drawing board for actual rendering for real. Based on the red herring method, yeah, yeah, I think you need to look at mysteries as a whole. Um, I mean, you could surprise yourself, I guess, if you pants it and see where it takes you. But I think it's kind of good to have almost the killer, like, ever present. Unless the point of the story is to, to actually have just been some bad man. Okay. It's the bad who you, your suspects weren't. You know, and it was, like, just some guy out of the blue, which happens in real life, too. Right? You got a list of suspects, and everyone's susceptible and then eventually it's actually some look good. Yeah, but you gotta be really careful with that because you you have to be careful. Um I'm gonna go into movies here. Um I liked M. Night Shyamalan's very first movie. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but the first guy was in there. Six Sixth Sense. 
Yeah. Really clever. Unbreakable, but semi clever. But after that, it always felt like he was cheating the audience. Because some of his answers were completely out of left field. I think the village is like the best example of that. Right? Yeah, it makes yeah, I like the rates. Yeah. Oh, oh I, I I just thought it was a cheat. That's the thing. Like like it was it's it's a clever cheat in one way, but in another he never really hinted at it. Like 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 he never really he never really gave a real yeah, he didn't drop the little clues along the way. He was very much on the left field. Yeah, I he, think maybe he went for the more shocking ending, like Yeah. Well is I, I think you have to be really careful with that because it's cool to have, like, you're right, in real life, crazy things happen you can't predict. You can't make it up, right? There's just no way you can make any of that stuff up. But, but you gotta do it, but again, there's a really fine line between having a left field moment and insulting your readership. Because you gotta remember something, too. If they've gone so far into the story, they've invested in it. So there has to, so when you do a payoff, even if you, if you have the, the, the crazy person, like, you know, payoff, there has to be some kind of well, yeah, you always would give an explanation. Like, you can't just say, yeah, you can't just introduce something that didn't come out of nowhere and then leave it alone. Yeah. Cause you it, have it, to explain their side of it. Yeah, and yeah, and walk, yeah. Which could then, that part could, could connect to everything else that the reader was invested into. Yeah, like, like uh, I, again, this, this is another movie that just escapes my brain. It's an old one. It's a really old movie. It doesn't work anymore because of how... The downside with these... Because you can't, there's no more sense of danger you can do in a film unless it's a period piece with the, with the, with the phone ringing, right? Yeah. That doesn't that doesn't that doesn't mean squat. You have to get rid of the phone now in movies. But it was a 10 minute build up scene to this killer. He goes, "Have you checked on the children? Have you checked on the children?" And it's it's really really good cinema. Um, it explains where this like the end of the, what you see at the in the 10 minutes very very well but they build it up they, the build up was brilliant and like I guess it, it's a very for me it's a very fine line I'm not saying that you can't do you, you, you can do a lunatic in fact chances are today with the way things are it's more likely to be the lunatic yeah. but but it, it it's um, they're, they're, you have to be very careful with the uh, oh how do I put this be very careful that you, you do it in a way that people can see it coming without feeling cheated. Right? Oh yeah, no, for sure. You got to think. Well, it's the whole plausible thing, like plausibility, right? Yeah. You can you can tell when a writer, um, whether it's for TV or books or whatever, you can tell when they've written themselves into a corner, and then they use the ghost in the machine mm -hmm. to fix the problem. Uh, do a machine, I think it's called. Do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gun machine. So, uh, I probably said it wrong, but you know what I'm talking about. So. Yeah. Yeah, you could tell if they've written themselves into a corner, and then, yeah, there's no payoff. But, and that's just laziness for them to not get, try to get out of that corner, even just a little bit, that you can introduce the conclusion. Or go back halfway and rewrite or something, I don't know. What I can't stand about current stories, especially current TV, uh, even the superheroes, I love superheroes so much, but, like, they, everybody's got their own oracle. The person at the computers was able to solve all the problems. Yeah. I kept thinking, like, it's ridiculous. Like, I wish you, you would have shown those are so fine technology so much. Like, I realize that's not our world that we live in, you and I, but it just, it's such a cheat because you could just, you could win every battle because they don't suddenly know how to reprogram something to suddenly get this piece of information that's vital to the case and eventually the hero gets there. They, they use it as a combo so much. Yeah, I, well, it, it's not... It, okay, it, there's a, there's a really um, there's a line with that. I don't think you can completely escape the oracle problem. I think though what what's missing is okay. Let's say me and you have a disagreement over a particular clue of evidence, what it could actually mean and be interpreted as. And this is something that they could they could do, right? And you don't do enough is you do a murder scene, okay? And you make it and CSI does this sometimes. But by and large, they even they cheat because they're all about the procedures. So they go through the procedural method of looking through things. But what, what would be more interesting is is when you have an oracle character, right? They're fallible too. They're not always going to be right. They shouldn't be. There should be like a mistake. There should be a miss like a more. It should be more of a chase instead of having. You can have an oracle. In fact, dare I say, I don't think you can escape that completely unless. 
your character is very, very self-reliant, i.e. the Punisher, the Punisher would be a character that wouldn't have an arm. Your will just say, like, I can't do that, like, my machine can't. Or, 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 or even, like, I screwed up. Because here's the thing, right? You yeah. assume that the technology is always going to be right. What if it's wrong? Right? What? Yeah, 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 right? What if it's wrong? And the, but again, it, part of it is also the format. As you got a one-hour television show. Um, it's really easy to just go to the point where you, you can skip some steps, right? And they they can't try to compensate sometimes with that depending on the vil who the villain is, depending on who the um, the character's history and interaction. Because sometimes that is more important than the oracle getting it right or wrong. Um, but it, by and large, when you look at the tools you have, it's always interesting to see, it's like, hey, I think this is one thing. No, it's something else entirely. Um, my next book is called The Cloud Diver. You know, the, the, it has a unicorn in it. I don't know if you've been watching any of my posts in the last little bit. That has been a little insane experiment in marketing, let me tell you. Um, but um, I, I figured out a way to, to incorporate the absurd with some absolutely terrifying things in it, too. And um, it, it, it works. But I'm having fun. I'm showing people the absurd stuff here. But when they read the book, they're like, that's still there. But there's a more, there are, the, the ability, I think, with books is you can create more intricate layers. It's easier, it's easier in literature to add layers to a story. Television, due to its constraints and due to the, to the thing, like budget, and due to the fact that it, by the, television, by its very nature, doesn't do the limited serial format. It, it tries to fill anywhere from 12 to 20 some odd episodes. 12 episodes, you can do a, a pretty cool serial. Or an experiment like 24, like with the format of that show allows, a, 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 no, but it'd be good. that's a clever format, but yeah, that doesn't work with a lot of TV shows, right? But 24 works, right, because of the very nature of the, of the format of the show. But beyond that, you're dealing with a lot of, um, a lot of single stories, you're dealing with a budget, you're dealing with a, you're dealing with a cast of, of, of people who may or may not be there every episode. You also have, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of factors there. So when you look at television, part of the limitation is just the nature of, of, of the beast itself. It's really hard to see, see a novel play out on television. It's been done, but it's not easy. And um, even with the novels I've seen, like Babylon 5 is an old show. It re if you watch it from start to finish, it's like a novel being played out on television. But if you look at it, it's not perfect because actors left, people came and went, right? Budget cuts, threats of cancellation, just natural, natural things in the in the progression of the show's life in the real world altered the fate of the show. So, so it's more, it's easier to do something like The Flash, where you have an uber arc, but you but you don't do it every episode. You just you have an episode here and there where you focus on, on. It was Smallville. Right? They had the adventure episodes, and then they pepper it with the mythology thing, which was the overall arc. Yeah, exactly. Now, now it, it, it's due to the nature of the television. Mythology episodes are always the best ones too. Oh, absolutely, but you can't guarantee those every episode, right? Because again, based on your availability, your budget, and like, there's a lot of factors there, right? In a perfect world, I. In a perfect world, you, you, I, like one of the shows I'm getting into right now, because I'm so behind, I'm so I'm so behind on it, is Fringe, right? It kind of starts like the X Files, but as you get deeper and deeper into it, there's a much more intricate plot than even what I thought X Files ever did, right? When you get to seasons three and four in particular, it's like holy crap, right? Um, but they they didn't get there overnight. It's, it's sometimes also too. It's about a television. A television show usually takes a season or two to find its voice. Like, what, whatever it's... Yeah, well, it's the third season, they always say it's growing the beard. That's where it's... Uh, yeah. It really found its footing. I was like that in Star Trek Next Generation, for example. Oh, absolutely. It really kicked into high gear and got really awesome. Yeah. Deep Space Nine was the other show I really, really liked. But again, it took about three years. Yeah. Um, I think Voyager, like, Voyager, the sad part is Voyager didn't find its voice, I think, until the last season, which is too bad. Good cast, it just but the and the last season's phenomenal. But you could skip literally like whole chunks of the show, and oh, you yeah, wouldn't. Easy. What? That was my least favorite of the series. Like, 
like out of all the series. But yeah, cool idea. Um, I loved I loved the um, caretaker. Like the, the, the pilot was one. I think the actually the best pilot of all of them. But you don't really need to watch any other episode now until <laughs> seven and nine joins the crew. Well, no, but it, it was such a neat idea. I love the idea instead of them exploring the universe they're trying to find a way back home it's an it, it, it they flipped the concept i thought it was brilliant yeah. right but they had no nothing to follow back on there was no um well no and eventually they started calling in you know Riker and all those guys yeah exactly that gets game readership there's that one new one coming up to uh star trek discovery yeah i, I haven't i i know i i may or may not see it i i don't know about you but oh. I don't know much about it. I saw the little teaser trailer they showed at like Comic Con. It was just basically the thing of the ship flying through space and then the music, right? But Michelle Yeoh is in it. Yes. And I'm a huge Michelle Yeoh fan, right? So I'll watch it even just for her because she's like a female Jackie Chan. Nice. Which is, like super awesome, right? So I don't know. We'll see. I don't know the whole concept of the show. I don't know what year it takes place. If it's after somewhere along the timeline in between, I don't. I really don't know. No, but uh, it, it'll, be, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see. Um, I, I, like I said, I'm really behind on television shows. I just don't have time anymore. I'm not sure. You know, I've watched maybe four hours of TV in the past three months. Like that's more than I have. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but no, because because here's the here, here's my problem. I'm not mature enough for Netflix. <laughs> you laugh at me. <laughs> but it's true. I, I get sucked in. Like it's really easy for me to get sucked. Into a show, um, I tried Netflix. Uh, my buddies were watching Daredevil. I love Daredevil season one. I watched it all in one night. Then I watched an anime series, Kill a Kill. I watched, we watched all that in one night. And I realized there was a real problem with Netflix. It's just too easy to keep going. It's well, too. Watching. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 really easy to binge on it. And you're like, you all grow it. It's like I can't afford to even grow into it because <laughs> if if I do, I don't get anything done. So what I do is. I still binge watch, but every once in a while, what I'll do is I'll watch a show like a show that that sounds really good. Like, but I like The Flash. Flash is a fun show, right? It, it's not the best show I've ever seen, but it's a lot of fun, and they, and 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 they and they're very consistent in that world. And Barry Allen, the Barry Allen's very likable. Um, but again, the characters I actually enjoy and I can root for, which not every show allows for. Um, so I'll watch that. Um, and then if I hear about a really good show, if I like a couple episodes, I'll eventually just go, okay, I'll get the DVD. And then one day when I'm a good boy and I'm finished my stuff and I'm bored, then I'll go and I'll sit down and I'll watch it. I've only seen, uh, for example, I like Arrow, Arrow, but I've only seen up to season two. Mm -hmm. And they're in season five or six right now. And again, I'm, waiting for the Blu-rays to come down in price, you know, and then I'll grab them. And then they give them a Supergirl. Like I, I watch the first four week to week and then I just, like, you know, lose time, and uh, so I waited and wound up on Netflix, like, that, that was my binge, you know, yeah. you have to binge, let's put it that way, schedule binge, it's Saturday's binge day, otherwise, you know, well, it's, we'll it, 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 done or something. Well, no, well, no it's because you, you, you got all these things you want to do, and you don't have time for, you don't have time, like, you can either watch these shows, or you can get stuff done. And, you know, very rarely do you have the luxury of doing both. I, I can't do it. So, and I know I can't do it. Some people can work with a show on in the background, and they know exactly what's going on while they're working. Which I... I, 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 I can't do that, personally. No, I'm like, ooh, this is awesome. Guys, yeah, yeah. It's like, this is awesome. Then then someone will try to talk to them, shush, this is important. Then three hours later, what the hell happened in my life? You know? Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm I'm gonna also get to the point now where I don't play video games as much anymore. I binge I, again. I binge those too. I I am literally when it comes to my entertainment, I'm a binger. So I I, I have to literally schedule my time now to binge, or yeah. I don't get squad done. So and you, yeah, it's even worse. Too. You got kids, so you you. <laughs> so I mean their I mean their recess is your recess kind of, but you I mean. Uh -huh. but they're at their, they're at the age now too where they don't need me to play with them all the time. Mm -hmm. they don't need to be their playmate because they have each other, you know. And that's how it was like for me growing up. Like my siblings were my playmates, and then mom and dad would play with us once in a while. Yeah. But yeah, I got I got past the point now where like I have to play with them all the time. I have to monitor them all the time. Yeah. How old are they at this point? Eleven and nine. Yeah, you're at the point now where they're going to need you less. They're still going to need you, 
Yeah, but, my more thing is just you can keep an ear out just to make sure nobody's killing the other guy. Is there? Are you okay? Just fine. A little blunt force trauma. That's it. Well, mm -hmm. well the funniest thing I ever grew was uh, one kid said, "Ow, you hit me." Then the other one says, "Because you told me to." Then he says, "Yeah, but not that hard." <laughs> I just couldn't help but laugh. No, what do you say to that? Right? Like, and I left it alone, and I just was sitting in the other room laughing because I saw it was too funny. Yeah, you're like, I, I, sh I'm, no, I'm, I'm not mature enough to be, have that conversation with them. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'm sure you were that way too. too. Yeah. Oh, they know the difference between you know funny fighting and real fighting. Right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Like, you know, and that's to say, you gotta let them. You, they're at the point now where they, they're gonna start growing and making their own choices, and you gotta let them. You don't have yeah. to be the tyrant anymore. Not quite, anyway. Well, I'm past that age. Yeah, past three or four when you have to move behind them. Literally yeah. behind them. Yes. <laughs> it's not that fun. You know, once they start going to school and they, gain, they learn independence and they grow, and it's like you and I did. So. Yeah, pretty much. So let's see here. We've gone all over things. We were supposed to talk about your writing process at some point, so I guess maybe we should do that now. Or did there we? I post recently on that. It said my writing process uh, and dash don't really have one. <laughs> Yes. You know, um, I know I'm at a place with my writing uh, approach where I don't care anymore. It sounds, I don't mean that in a negative way. It's, it's more so just, you know, when I first started, I was very particular about it. I thought a lot about the craft. I thought a lot about the form. I was over analytical with the whole thing. And with more and more experience and more and more books coming out, um, I just do it really very, very much casually. I just come up with an idea and go with it. And I don't try to perfect every sentence. I don't try to perfect every paragraph. I don't try to perfect every scene. Um, I just let the story go where it goes. Um, at least especially on first draft. First draft I, I, is a non-edit draft. You just spit it out as it is, even if it's crap. And then once that's done, go back and... Um, and, re and revise and yeah you know amp up if things need amped up in certain areas and whatever but I, I learned a long time ago that it's not worth obsessing over um, this stuff because I have done, walked that road of obsessing over my own work you know and is it good enough is it high quality enough um, and, it, and now I'm just more interested in having fun with it and that's taken I, a lot of stress off and that's actually improved the quality of the writing well, more, well yeah, yeah you got to write what's fun with you. I mean, look, right now, literally, I I'm, I, I stop because of the wonderful um, real life situation. But I'm literally at the point where I am having a unicorn at Bart Ramos and a demon are running from a dragon, very similar to the dragon in Nighty Night Bugs, <laughs> right? So yeah. that's because it's funny. I'm having a blast, and it, it's fun for me. I'm having a blast, and and it makes again serious story, believe it or not. But th it makes sense in the context of the, of, of the story. Uh, and I'm, I wrote that scene because it's fun. I don't need to have that scene in there. But I figure if I'm having fun, it'll translate to my readers. You know, because that that's people can tell when you're when you when you're having fun. Like people, like it's one of those things that I think that just I pick up on it in the description or in the narrative or whatnot. Um, if the writer was indeed having fun, or if they were phoning it in or forcing forcing it. Yeah. Um, but you could tell when they're actually because there's a flow to it that you just you subtly pick up on, you know, mm -hmm. like a sixth sense kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So, what book today are you proud of? Oh, shit. Uh, give me two seconds to think. That's no, okay. I was, it's an evil question. It really is. It's a terrible question. I think the one I'm the most proudest of is my which I really got to get back to is uh, the first book in my Arc of Light series called The Way of the Fog. It's an epic fantasy. It's a quarter of a million words long. Um, it's the first book of about six. Um, and it's, you know, my attempt of, at, like, you know, my Lord of the Rings kind of deal, right? And I'm really proud of it because I spent time world building. I spent time putting a lot of uh, description into it, a lot of action, a lot of drama, a lot of romance. Um, and it was a lot of work. That's a lot of words. I mean, that's the equivalent of approximately three standard length novels for one book. Yes. You know? Um, so I'm really proud of doing it. I wrote it in seven months, the first draft. Wow. 
you know, yeah. And that was back, way back in 2003, I think, is when I wrote it. It didn't come off. Um, but, and it only came out in hardcover, so, like, I had plans to eventually get out there and paperback and ebook and all that crap, and then release the second one, which is a third written at about 80,000 words right now. So, but I have some other stuff i got to throw up my plate first. But I think in terms of, like, a writer's feat, so to speak, uh, that's the one I'm most proud of. It's not my favorite story that I've ever done, but it's the one I'm most proud of. Fair enough. So I'm going to ask this. You sound like you sound like you've gone through this journey. Of, um, and we haven't gotten into all the details. I do want to actually talk about some of the stuff off the air a little bit before we, before we go. You yeah. went through a period of you, you ran into certain walls when you started your art uh, your art career, quote unquote. You yeah. you you figured out along the way um, who you are as a creative person, and it probably and it probably was a bit. It sounds like it was a big process for you. Right, um, it, 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 from where you started with with your earlier stuff to where you are now. So my my final question before we get to the shameless plugging and or you know and and stuff is, are you happier as a creator now? I'm way happier as a creator now than I was even a year ago. Mm -hmm. You've been following my newsletter. I can't remember how long ago you subscribed, but like if you started from year, because I'm in year three of the newsletter right now. And if you start in year one, you'll see different things I talk about, and a lot of it was me finding my footing um, in this business and what I want to do with it and what I want to do as a creator. And um, I'm, you know, the whole the cliche, uh, you know, that I don't sell me. True, found yeah. for me was the thing I, I needed to work on was to not try to be like so and so, or whether in comics or in books, or even follow industry rules per se is just do my own thing make my own stuff that makes me happy share it because there's other people out there like me who would enjoy it and just have fun with it now yeah. you know and that's that's where I'm at now and I find it released a lot of uh, creative energy in me good approach <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. but it works well it no works. It, it, it's I like it the hardest, the hardest thing I took me a long time to figure out, and, and it was who I was. And the moment I figured that out, um, my writing has become better. Like I, 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 I'm good enough to know that I can still have a lot to go learn, right? I, and I, and I, this is just me personally. I'm good enough to know that I have a lot to still learn, but I'm confident enough in who I am that I'm not afraid to follow my ass anymore. Anyway. So. Yeah, no, exactly, and that's the thing. It takes time, like whether it's writing or an art, you got to find your voice. And art, you to find your style, you know. And it that's a process. You need to only do it by not only producing work, but also sharing it with others and just learning about not just the uh, the work itself, but also the business that that work pertains to. Alrighty. So, we have a decent conversation, I think, for a podcast. So, where can people find you? Uh, everywhere. Anywhere and everywhere. Basically, uh, my main website is canisterx.com. Uh, there are links to my Facebook page, you know, facebook.com slash apfooks. There's Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, again, slash apfooks. Instagram is something I've been really focusing on lately. Um, there's Pinterest, there's Tumblr. Um, so you can look me up on there. But if you want to start at a main hub, then go to canisterx.com. And then the big thing, too, I like doing is I have the weekly newsletter, the Canister X Transmission, and that can be found at tinyletter.com slash apfuchs. For those listening, Fuchs is spelled F-U-C-H-S. And, yes, I've heard every joke under the sun regarding my last name, so that's... <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. But the new is a good one. I like that one. It's sort of like uh, sort of a private blog in a way to that specific audience, you know. You, you, at, at some point, you should be taking your flash fiction and you should release a collection called The Cancer X Files. The Cancer X No, are you seriously? Seriously. Uh, okay. I'm releasing the flash fiction that's being uh, aired in, in year three as a collection uh, yeah. when it's done. The yes. Yeah. But, uh, and there'll be some extra class fiction that wasn't aired in the newsletter yeah, either. The, the, the church, so. No, I, I, I just, I just, I, sorry, it just came in my head literally to say, that's what you should do. And it's like, you should be like this, like this, the cover should be like this, like, like old, like film projector kind of deal, right? And it's got like, it's got like, yeah, it's got X on it, 
right, and do not open until such and such a date, whatever you release it, and then that's like just something fun because it seems like it, because you do there's some of them I like, some of them I don't, but all in all, I I, I can appreciate it's ballsy. Like every week, you have a new story. It's re, it, it, that's it's impressive. Yeah, and like I said, that even in the newsletter, some some stories some people have loved, other ones people have not not as much. Um, but that's okay. I mean, like, whatever. Back to it's, multi, it's multi genre too, right? So I, I it's a good like my mind that week. It's a good exercise. Yeah, that's that's actually what I was about to say. It's a great exercise to actually um, do stuff. As is me, I'm just having fun on my newsletter. I'm, I, I talk about random, random stuff, and it's just I, I, I feel that's that's just where I'm at right now. Up the way, although I'll, as I get doing more newsletters, it'll refine itself more and more too. And that's kind of. I'm gonna go in the opposite direction because right now my first three years are, are divided into those four sections, right? Yeah. Thematic, and year four, I'm I need a break from that. Uh, right. like structure, so I'm actually going to do more of the casual letter, at least for the first six months. Try it from there and see what people think. And then, man, if, you know, if it's positive feedback, we'll stick with the casual letter. If uh, people like hate it, then we'll maybe go back to the four point or something like that. Fair enough. All right. Oh, and one last thing. You have a Kickstarter, right? So when's that, when's that going up? It starts up with uh, on March 22nd is with me and Jeff Burton. Uh, his character Aurora Man is meeting my character Axiom Man in novel format. He's also it's a, sort of a dual Kickstarter. He's kickstarting uh, the release of the first issue of the Aurora Man comic book. Issue number zero is already done and kickstarted successfully. So now this is for the number one. And at the end of the number one issue, there's about a six page uh, or so lead in to an, uh, Axiom Man Aurora Man novel called Frozen Storm, and it's where these two characters meet, and we take on snowman uh, zombie type stuff um, in a very Witcher-like setting, so that's what Canada is all about, of course. Snowman zombies, and, uh, nice. And that was a cool conversation I had with AP. Um, you can check out you can check out his Kickstarter, which the full the full term for it is the Adventures of Aurora Man Number One and Axiom Man Team Up Novel. It's a novel putting together Axiom Man, which is one of AP's coolest characters. Just had its relaunch of its first novels in its tenth anniversary edition, and Aurora Man. Who uh, is also is goes by the name of Jeff Burton. So this is actually a really, really, really cool idea, and uh, you guys should apply to or at least be people aware of it. You can look it up: The Adventures of Aurora Man Number One and Axiom Man Team Up Novel. So take a look, back it up. It's cool, um, and like I said, just great stuff all around. All right. And that will do it for another edition of Just Joshing. So, if you want to support the site, you can follow me either on Podomatic where you ho- or iTunes, which everyone you listen to. Just subscribe. Tell your friends. Uh, you can buy my books, The Watcher, Storm Dancer, which are available through MirrorWorldBooks.com or Amazon.com or any other place where books are sold. Uh, you can get my merch, and like I said, sooner or later, I'm going to actually have a merchandise commercial to explain that. Uh, tell your friends about the podcast, but whatever you do, whether you support this or not, thank you for listening. And remember, whatever you're going for right now, stay inspired out there. You can do it. I really do believe it. All right? All right. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, guys. Take care. Josh. Josh.